it's really uh, very exciting, and uh, we're we're really very very uh, uh, grateful to uh, Neymar Kani Hamed from the Institute for Advanced Study for agreeing to come over and giving us a progress report, as he says, on, on this very exciting area that's associated with the amazing discoveries. Uh, although, as we were chatting just beforehand, uh, you would have expected that this discovery would have happened a little bit sooner. But um, we heard uh, uh, from Jim Olson back in September about the uh, exciting discovery of the Higgs boson at the LHC. And um, uh, he talked about all of the detailed measurements and things that, 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 that went into showing that it really is, is for real and the implications for the standard model and how it uh, uh, is a wonderful fit uh, with the standard model. Uh, but uh, uh, Neymar Akani Hamed, who's uh, uh, recognized as uh, one of the most brilliant particle physicists uh, in the world today uh, at and is currently at the Institute, um, has some very interesting, intriguing ideas about this discovery. And it's also within the spirit of what we like to talk about in our field, too, about the importance of validation. And uh, so you have a wonderful discovery of actually observing the Higgs boson and seeing a correlation with a uh, fundamental theory that's been around for 48 years. And then what's next? And of course, there's a lot of what's next. And, and Nima will talk about that in the context of, uh, of uh, if you look at very, very weak forces within the model, the gravitational forces, and the scale of the visible universe, there's a lot of open questions to be answered, and Nima will, will answer these, <laughs> or at least uh, uh, lead us into that direction. Um, he's currently at the Institute for Advanced Study. He's a, a professor uh, in the School of Natural Sciences and has been there since 2008. He got his PhD at Berkeley in 1997, and at a very rapid pace, he went on to a, a, a professorship at Harvard University, uh, where and then he was recruited away by the Institute in 2008. And uh, so, extraordinarily rapid rise, great recognition for his achievements. And so, with all of that, um, I think uh, this is a good way to segue into hearing what you have to say, Nima. So, welcome. Um, finally set foot on the uh, uh, grounds here. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks a lot for the uh, invitation. Uh, <clears throat> and what I want to tell you about, um, uh, th th since, since you already had a talk from, from Jim, uh, this talk isn't going to be all about the uh, magnificent um, experiment and all the incredible challenges that had to be overcome by thousands of dedicated people over decades. Uh, uh, to finally make this discovery, I'm mostly going to be talking about the conceptual issues that are raised around the discovery of the Higgs, um, and actually more broadly where it fits into where we are in our understanding of fundamental physics today. And a sort of quick summary is we're in a fantastically uh, exciting and confusing situation right now. And that's really what the theme of the talk is, is going to be. Um, on the one hand, we're in a wonderful situation because we are building off an incredible uh, and very solid theoretical framework uh, that, uh, as far as we understand, can be used to, uh, the broad framework can be used to predict and understand any phenomenon we're likely to run into at the LHC or in any future conceivable experiment. Uh, and uh, this extreme rigidity in uh, the laws of nature is something really new. It's not, it wasn't true 100 years ago, it wasn't even true 50 years ago. But we understand that it's true now, and it follows from uh, really the two revolutions of uh, early 20th century physics, relativity and quantum mechanics, um, each one of which by itself is relatively constraining on what the world can look like, but isn't uh, infinitely constraining, but taken together are almost infinitely constraining. <laughs> And uh, on the one hand, we understand that relativity and quantum mechanics largely makes the structure of the universe we see around us almost inevitable. So that's the, that's the positive side. The negative side is that relativity and quantum mechanics seem to make the universe around us impossible. Uh, and it's really uh, trying to uh, understand how these things can both be true at the same time, which is going to be the theme, uh, is, is what I'm going to talk about uh, in this talk. 
Now, properly speaking, uh, uh, correct length for this talk is about an hour and a half. And so I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to, uh, uh, at least I'm going to try not to go uh, that long. But it really breaks into two parts. The first part is to try to explain to you uh, the inevitability of the Higgs, <laughs> um, why we knew it had to be there. Actually, uh, even though uh, the theory for the Higgs has been there for a long time, um, it's actually rather shocking that something as simple as the Higgs ends up being responsible for the physics that it's responsible for. And um, if you're a sophisticated quantum field theorist in 1985, uh, you would have bet against the Higgs a lot, um, or maybe 1980. By 1985, we knew a few things already indirectly. But there are lots of reasons to suspect that, uh, that something as simple as the Higgs couldn't possibly be true. And it was really by the late 80s and early 90s that we had good indirect evidence that something like the Higgs had to be there, and then we finally found it more or less where it had to be. So, the first thing I want to explain, and put the, putting this in the broader context of why it is that uh, we're so sure that something like this uh, should happen, even though it took almost 50 years, why were we sure that we had to find the Higgs and, uh, and more or less knew it had to be? Is it, was it dumb luck? Was it, was it uh, that we had blind faith in the kinds of theories uh, we use to describe nature? It's neither of those. It's because of this thing that I've mentioned already we have discovered that the basic principles of relativity and quantum mechanics are so constraining that there's incredibly few things that we can do. And the Higgs is actually the latest and a rather dramatic uh, uh, addition, uh, an extension of that story. So that's the first part, to try to convince you that we know what we're talking about. Uh, in order to then go into the second part and uh, try to explain what these crises are. Um, and uh, there's a sort of very foundational crisis going back to what relativity and quantum mechanics or really space time and quantum mechanics really might mean and are that I won't talk about. But there is another question that has to do with extremely basic things about the world around us. You might want to ask the sort of simplest question of all. The world around us is big. Why is it big? Why do we have a big universe filled with big things? Uh, it's, a, it's a question a, a five-year-old might ask. Uh, but we have a terrible answer to that question. And it's really that question uh, uh, that, that, as I said, it seems that relativity and quantum mechanics makes the world impossible. It seems to make, want to make it impossible for there to be a macroscopic big universe. And I want to explain why that's the case and the, and the very divergent kinds of possibilities for uh, new physics beyond the theories that we've seen that might be responsible for answering that question. We don't know what the answer to that question is yet. But we're sort of a bifurcatory moment in the development of the subject, which would go one way or the other. And we will have some, I think, solid answers to which way we're going to go by 2020. So as I said, we're in a very sort of exciting and confusing period right now. And uh, so it's probably one of the last times talks like this will be given, because in five years, we'll have some semblance of an answer of which road it is that nature has taken. All right. So, um, so I will probably spend a little less time on the first subject of the inevitability of, of the Higgs and of the sort of physical laws in general. Um, uh, but anyway, let's, let's, let's see how we go. So part one, why we're so great and we understand everything, OK? OK, so let's uh, just a very brief summary of what we know about the world. Uh, things around us are made out of matter. Um, of course, we have uh, electrons going around protons in the atom. and uh, and protons and neutrons are made out, out of up and down quarks. And there are more exotic forms of matter as well, of course, that many of you are familiar with. And uh, acting on these matter are these four basic interactions that we've known about for a long time. Uh, gravity uh, and electromagnetism, which were already known to the ancients. And then the weak and the strong uh, forces that were discovered in the very early part of the 20th century, the very late uh, 1800s. Um, now, on the face of it, all of these interactions look extremely different. Uh, well, maybe gravity and, and uh, Coulomb's law look similar because they're both inverse square laws. But all the rest of them seem very different, uh, and in particular look extremely different than the weak and the strong forces that operate on very, very short distance scales. Um, but one of the wonderful things that we've learned uh, is that all of these interactions are actually associated with one basic kind of picture uh, and one basic sort of interaction, which is concatenated many, many times uh, to give rise to all the phenomenon we see 
in nature. For example, electromagnetism is associated with a little stick figure like this, giving an interaction between electrons and photons. Uh, uh, gravity is associated with exactly the same kind of stick figure or Feynman diagram uh, associated with the uh, interaction between electrons and gravitons. And then you get to stick these stick figures together in every possible way you can in order to give rise to every possible process that you might be interested in. So for example, if we stick these two guys, two of these guys together, uh, we get what we would call uh, the electromagnetic scattering of two electrons off of each other. And uh, in some language, I, I want to stress this as a language, it doesn't necessarily reflect uh, reality, <laughs> uh, but there's a very convenient language for thinking about uh, these pictures, um, uh, which is that uh, this photon isn't, isn't actually real, but it's a sort of a virtual photon, um, which, uh, which we get to excite out of the vacuum quantum mechanically because uh, of the uncertainty principle. And, and one thing that we learned right away from this is that the size of these quantum mechanical fluctuations, whatever they are, have got to get smaller and smaller as we go to larger and larger distances. That's ultimately what's responsible for the inverse square law. Okay? So we have these quantum fluctuations uh, for these virtual particles that get smaller and smaller as we go to larger and larger distances. Anyway, then when we put these interactions together in every possible way, we can get many, many more complicated processes. But all of electromagnetism arises from just gluing together these basic, uh, that basic little stick figure interaction. And once we learn that, uh, remarkably, what was learned in the 50s, 60s, and 70s is that all of the interactions that we know of have, exa uh, are, have basically the same character. Uh, the strong force, the usual way of talking about the strong force in the earlier part of the 20th century is a force that keeps protons and uh, uh, neutrons together inside nuclei, we now understand as a sort of a residual of the actual strong force. Uh, the actual strong force inside operates on the actual quarks and gluons, uh, the, the quarks, the, the constituents of the nucleons, and is associated with interaction between quarks and gluons. Similarly, the weak interactions are associated with interactions between electrons and neutrinos and cousins of the photon called the W particle, and uh, there's uh, an analogous, uh, uh, closely related interaction between just uh, two electrons and a cousin of the photon called the Z particle. The important point is that these are all exactly the same basic structure, okay? So all the interactions we know are associated with these little stick figure, uh, uh, these putting together these little stick figures. So why is it that they seem so incredibly different? Why did it take thousands of years for us to discover this, this, uh, this basic fact? And this really goes to the heart of why particle physics is interesting. Um, often people talk about this part of science in in, a, in, a, in, in one language, you know, like uh, wanting to know what the ultimate building blocks of matter are and things like that. And that may motivate some people. Um, it's not what motivates me and it's not what motivates many of my, my colleagues. It's not so much that. Um, it's that we've discovered the hard way uh, that to really understand the, the essential simplicity and unity of the laws of nature, you have to go to short distances. And the basic similarity between all the different interactions are masked by what are, from a fundamental point of view, details at long distances. So what's going on is that very short distances, short range here is compared to around 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. I remind you an atom is around 10 to the minus 8 centimeters big. The size of the proton and the neutron themselves is around 10 to the mi minus 14 centimeters. So a distance is around 100 times smaller even than the uh, nucleons. Um, we finally see that all these interactions look the same. Um, but at long distances, uh, it, the reason the weak interactions look so weak is that those particles, the W and Z, are massive. Um, they have a mass around 100 times uh, the mass of the proton. And therefore, the size of this interaction that they mediate gets exponentially suppressed at long distances. So you don't see it at long distances other than an incredibly weak interaction, so weak that it makes, causes a neutron sitting in outer, outer space to decay in 15 minutes <laughs> Uh, even though, you know, the neutron is a tiny thing governed by microscopic laws. Okay. Um, so that's why we go to short distances, because uh, th this essential simplicity and unity is obscured at, uh, at long distances. All right, now another important feature uh, that particles have is uh, that they have a spin. This is a fundamental feature of... Uh, of uh, any elementary particle. In fact, it's one of its labels. And we can think of the electron, for example, as a little 
loosely as a little spinning top. Um, that's the ultimate origin of magnetism, as you know. Uh, and um, because the world is quantum mechanical, the angular momentum is quantized in units of Planck's constant. And for good reasons, it has to come in multiples of one half times h bar. So we can have particles of spin zero, spin a half, spin one, two. In principle, we could have particles of spin 77 halves. Uh, we could have any multiple of a half h bar. In practice, the particles we see around us in nature have a very simple set of spins. For example, electrons have a spin of a half times h bar. W bosons uh, have a spin one times h bar. And photons, uh, we'll come back to this, but they, they have a spin of one times h bar as well. Gravitons have a spin two times h bar. We haven't seen anything with spin 77 times h bar or, or things that are much more complicated. So the particles that we see are extremely simple. So this is the sort of basic, uh, the basic building blocks for all the interactions and the matter that we've seen in nature are particles with just uh, uh, spins of a half, one, and two. The spin two guy is totally unique. It's the graviton. Uh, and these little stick figure kinds of interactions. So uh, the things that I mentioned already, I don't know why I put the W there, but the electron and the photon, the electron and the graviton, for example. And then, for example, gluons can interact with each other. The photons can't. So that's one of the detailed differences between them. But it's still all basically the same. These essential stick figure interactions that we concatenate to make uh, anything uh, that happens in nature. All right, so this isn't so important to go through in detail, but I'm just saying that the particles that you all know and love and are familiar with uh, are in this list, as are all the other things that we've seen. So there's a whole menu of particles made of quarks and leptons, and they, they interact with photons, Ws and Zs, gluons and gravitons. The actual menu is a little bit complicated, but the thing which is not complicated is, is the structure of the menu. Okay, just this very tiny menu of spins interacting in this uh, extremely simple A, B, C kind of stick figure way. So the first question is, why is it so simple? Why do we only see these simple fundamental interactions like A, B, C? Why don't we have to worry that, uh, why don't we see other interactions with you know, six particles coming in and 12 particles going out? That would be a disaster, right? If we had to, if, if, if we needed to know all of those things, uh, there's no way that, that, that we could make any predictions. It would be hard to imagine uh, any sort of simplicity in the laws of nature. We don't see it, but why? That's the first question. And secondly, why do we have such a tiny menu of spins? Why don't we have these particles of spin 77, okay? So those are the questions that I want to spend a few minutes answering, because they'll give you a sense for why we have so much confidence that no matter what happens at the LHC, no matter what happens at a machine of 100 or 1,000 times higher energy, we might see surprising particles, we might be surprising phenomenon, but there's a framework sitting there for them to fit into and for us to, to think about it. We're not starting from scratch over and over again. So I want you to understand why that is. And this really goes back to the power of relativity and quantum mechanics taken together. We don't know everything about the laws of nature, certainly, but uh, we've had these, uh, but we've known about relativity and quantum mechanics for over 100 years now. And there's a remarkable fact that whatever the ultimate theory is, so long as it's consistent with the principles of relativity and quantum mechanics, then at long enough distances, and long as long compared to any scale any, any of us care about, <laughs> we'll, we'll be a little more quantitative, enough, uh, quantitative about it in a second, at long enough distances, first of all, it's guaranteed because of relativity and quantum mechanics. It's guaranteed that all we'll see, the most important interactions we'll see, the most dominant interactions we'll see are these ABC ones, first of all. So that's not some lucky accident. That's a consequence of these principles. And secondly, remarkably, uh, if you just handed a bunch of competent theorists relativity and quantum mechanics, you lock them away in a room, you refuse to let them look outside at the universe. It's a little counterfactual because they're in a room, so, which is in the universe. But anyway, uh, if you ignore that, if you just lock them away and ask them what could the world possibly look like consistent with these principles, and you gave them long enough, they would come up with that, and they would tell you the only possible spins we're allowed to have have to come out of that set. Zero, one half, one, three halves, and two. Okay. And the two has got to be unique, and the particle associated with that 
my gosh, gives you this interesting inverse square law that's universally attractive and, uh, and, and it's gravity. Okay? And all the other ones are exactly the, 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 the forces interactions that we've seen around us. Okay? Now, I, I, I put in red zero and three halves because those are the things that we haven't seen yet in, in our story so far. Uh, we'll be getting to zero in a moment and I'll tell you something about three halves later. All right, so that's, that's the claim, is that uh, that's the first part of the claim I made, that the essential properties of the universe at long distances are not some capricious accident of, of uh, the particular way we write down theories or our senses of aesthetics of what's beautiful and not in physics. They are nailed. There's nothing we can do about them. They are nailed by these basic principles of relativity and quantum mechanics. Okay, so I want to explain that to you, or at least explain the structure of the argument to you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to do this as, uh, as honestly and correctly as possible, but there is one step where you will have had to go to a year of grad school in theoretical particle physics to understand what's going on. So, but, but anyway, we'll, we'll get to that point, um, and, um, uh, but you will certainly understand what the logical structure of the argument is. So I have to explain to you two things. A, why is it that we only see these stick figure ABC interactions and not these mo much more complicated things with six in, 13 out? And B, why do we have this tiny menu of spins? So let's start with A. And understanding A uh, begins by thinking about something extremely basic and important, which is units. Okay, so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about units. If you get absolutely nothing out of the rest of this talk, um, especially some of the younger people here, uh, remember this way of thinking about units. It'll serve you well in, 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 in your life. So uh, units were the, uh, were the bane of my existence as a as a high school physics student, I could never keep track of all, all of them and the conversions between them and so on. And you know, you feel really bad uh, about not being able to remember these things. But, but I later learned that there was a good reason uh, that it was all so confusing, because there was nothing actually deeply correct about it. Okay? The units that we use, it's always this case in physics. Whenever something is sort of very hard and complicated, it's sort of your fault, not the fault of, of physics. And in this case, it's really your fault. It's the fault of human beings because these units are based around artificial human constructs. So, for example, when we say that, that, uh, that something is two meters long, um, what, we, what, we, what we mean or what we meant until they came up with these fancier definitions of the meter is that there's this bar in Paris <laughs> And if you take that bar in Paris and you lay it next to the, the, the thing that you're measuring, two of the bars will, uh, will equal the height of this guy, right? So if you're trying to uh, explain that this tall basketball player is two meters tall to an alien you know, in Alpha Centauri, it wouldn't do much good to say that they're two meters tall because they'd have to come to Paris and get that bar. They have no idea what you're actually talking about, right? All the other units that we talk about, typically talk about, are these artificial human constructs. So it's better to work with natural units, units that actually have something to do with nature <laughs> rather, than, uh, rather than these things that we, we do as humans. And especially uh, because the world has both quantum mechanics and relativity, it's useful to work in units where Planck's constant and the speed of light are set equal to one. Now, what does that mean? This, well, this is very familiar in the case of, of, of the speed of light. What that really means is that we use the same unit to measure time and distance. Okay? We can either say that something is uh, three ten to the eight meters from us, or we can say it's one light second from us, and those are those are the same unit. So we can translate between space, uh, between distance and time using c, and also because energy and time, uh, the multiple of energy and time as the units of Planck's constant, we can use Planck's constant to convert between energy and one over time. Okay, so if we do that, you see we can reduce all units to one kind of unit. And in, in particle physics, we find it convenient to make that unit a unit of mass or of energy. So the mass of the proton, m proton c squared, the energy of the proton, uh, is around 0.938 GeV, um, giga electron volt. Now, of course, Mr. Volt was a person, so it's a little bit lucky that one giga electron volt is close to something natural. Uh, for this talk, I'll redefine a giga electron volt to be the mass of the proton, okay? So um, anyway, so uh, in these units, we can measure everything in units of GeV. For example, the size of the proton is around 10 to the minus 40, 14 centimeters. That's one over a GeV. So the units of length and energy are inverse to each other, okay? All right, so the proton is around one over a GeV. And therefore, I could tell my friend in Alpha Centauri that I'm roughly 10 to the 16th inverse GeV tall. 
And that immediately tells them something. It tells them that if they put 10 to the 16 protons end to end, they get me. So the protons there are the same as here, so that's useful information. Okay? Uh, my mass is around 10 to the 29 GeV. That's also very useful information. It tells you something immediately. I have around 10 to the 29 protons and neutrons in me because that's where m most of my mass is. So these, these natural units are really useful. They, they tell you something immediately about the object that you're talking about. Uh, the, uh, the length of this lecture, if you're lucky, is around 10 to the 27th inverse GeV, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Which is 10 to the 27 times how long it takes light to traverse the size of, of a proton. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the center of mass energy of the collisions at the LHC are 7,000 GeV, which is 7,000 times the uh, uh, rest mass of the proton and so on, okay? All right, why are thinking about these units so useful? Because we can go back to some very familiar forces and learn something very interesting about them, okay? Let's go and think about the electric force between two electrons. We know from high school that it scales like an inverse square law, so there's some coefficient in, found in front of it. Now there's no more k and epsilon naught and mu naught, whatever those things are, I don't remember. I don't care, I'm just gonna call it some constant. Let's call it q squared for the product of the charges of the two electrons. Now here's the beautiful point. The units of force, which are mass times acceleration, are the same as energy squared. Or one over length squared. Well, let's 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 think about it. The units of acceleration are are velocity per time. So so the units of velocity are dimensionless, right? Uh, so one over time as units of energy, or one over length, uh, and the mass as units of one over length. So the units of force is one over length squared. One over r squared is also one over length squared. And so we learn immediately that whatever sits in front of it is just a pure number. It's a pure dimensionless number, okay? That's really cool. We can work out what that number is, and it's around 1 over 137. It's the famous fine structure constant. But the important point is that there is an invariant sense in which electromagnetism is weak. The strength of the force in natural units is small. It's a small number, 10 to the, around 10 to the minus 2. Okay, we can contrast that with gravity. Force of gravity is g newton times the product of the masses over r squared. Exactly the same logic tells us that g newton times the product of the masses is dimensionless, but that means that g newton should have units of length squared. So in these units, g newton isn't a pure number. It has units of length squared, and that length is this famous Planck length, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Okay? So that's what the Planck scale is. It's just the Newton constant. Okay? The Newton constant is the square of the Planck scale. This also tells us something very important about gravity. Gravity is in no invariant sense a weak or a strong force. At long distances, it's weak compared to L Planck, but as you approach L Planck, it starts getting strong, okay? Unlike electromagnetism, which is always weak in some invariant sense. And one over this scale is around 10 to the 19th GeV, and that's, uh, that's the Planck mass or the Planck energy, and that's, that's a scale which is some 16 orders of magnitude higher than any scale we, we, we might hope to look at. I mean, certainly around 16 orders of magnitude higher, for example, than the energies being probed by, by the LHC. We'll come back to that in a second, why it's so tiny. All right. There's another important feature of, these, of this dimensional analysis, which goes back to, uh, to the fact that the world is, is quantum mechanical. So when we collide two electrons, we don't know what happens <laughs> ahead of time. It, when, when we do this, the same experiment in exactly the same, preparing exactly the same initial state, two electrons in, sometimes they'll come out at 10 degrees, sometimes they'll come out at 40 degrees. Um, so we can't predict exactly what will happen experiment by experiment. We can predict the amplitude or the probability that it, that it comes out at, at, at any angle. The probability is a square of some amplitude. And by staring at these pictures for what what gives rise to this process, concatenating our basic uh, ABC interactions, we learned that the amplitude goes like this Q squared. So the amplitude is around 1%. That's the tiny number that we're talking about before. So that's another feature of this dimensional analysis. It tells us that most of the time, they don't interact, okay? The, the amplitude for the interaction is small. Again, that's dramatically different than gravity. This in one slide is the deep difficulty with putting quantum mechanics and gravity together. One of the aspects of it, again, it's just this trivial dimensional analysis, 
And it has to do with the fact that this amplitude isn't just a small number. It's G Newton times the energy squared, the energy of the process squared. And that amplitude is minuscule for energies tiny compared to the Planck scale, but gets of order one for energies comparable to the Planck scale. And if you naively extrapolate, it would be bigger than one. That's why there's a difficulty putting quantum mechanics and gravity together. It's not because we can't say the word quantum mechanics and gravity in the same sentence. We certainly can. We can even make predictions for what the, for what the quantum mechanical corrections to Newton's laws are at very long distances. It's that we don't know what happens at very high energies or very short distances, and you can see why. This amplitude is starting to become comparable to one. That makes no sense, because the amplitude squared is a probability. All the probabilities have got to add up to one. If the amplitude is 1.5, there's just something logically wrong. Okay? You can't have a sum of a bunch of positive numbers bigger than one equal to one. So that's why there is something dramatically wrong. But it's not, uh, not like you read in some popular books that the world of the large is described by general relativity and the world of the small is described by quantum mechanics. That's just rubbish. We know perfectly well how to talk about uh, even quantum effects of gravity at very long distances. It's that we don't know what's going on at very short distances because of this simple dimensional analysis. All right. Now, the most important consequence of this very simple dimensional analysis is the following. Uh, it tells us why we only see these ABC interactions at long distances. Okay? And the reason is what well, we've seen already. These interactions, the interaction between electron and photon, the size of that interaction is 1 over 137. Okay? That's, a, that's a small number. It's dimensionless. Okay? But if it's a small number. It's not all that small, but it's dimensionless. I told you that all the interactions look pretty much the same when you go to very short distances. So for example, the analogous strength between two, two quarks and a gluon is stronger. It's around 10 times stronger, but it's still pretty much a small number. So the, the similar thing between electrons and neutrinos on the W is around a 60th. It's sort of halfway in between. Right? But what if we imagine interactions that added more and more photons here? What if those things were actually there? Well, they might be there, but we'll never notice them, and they're not relevant for describing the world at long distances. And the reason is very simple. We already learned uh, from the fact that the, the size of the quantum uh, fluctuation of the photon has got to get smaller and smaller as you go to larger and larger distances to be compatible with the inverse square law, right? That the size of the fluctuation is, gets smaller as you go to bigger distances and larger as you get to smaller distances. That means that if I'm colliding two electrons, if I want to emit another photon, it has to get easier and easier as I go to higher energies. <laughs> it, the strength can't be constant. It has to depend on energy. It has to get easier and easier as you go to higher and higher energies. But the flip side of that is that this cannot be a dimensionless interaction. It has to have units. Okay? And it has a strength that goes like some length to a positive power. And similarly for all the rest of them. Okay? So, Whatever is going on at very short distances, perhaps near the Planck length, where really all hell is breaking loose, uh, at long distances, even if all these more complicated interactions are there, for this basic feature of dimensional analysis, we're not going to notice them. All that's going to be relevant for describing the universe at long distances is A, B, C. And, and I want to stress this is not completely trivial. It's dimensional analysis plus this feature about our world, which we have the inverse square law. For example, this conclusion would not be true in a universe that only had one dimension of space and one of time. There, if you just think about what the electric flux lines look like, the force is a constant. It doesn't drop as you go to longer distances. And it turns out that in a universe with one dimension of space and one of time, you need an infinite number of these things. You need to keep track of an infinite number of them. Okay? So, but our universe with three dimensions of space and one of time, uh, this is true. So that's the first fact, basically dimensional analysis. But it's remarkable. It simplifies drastically. Uh, the kinds of rules that we need to use to describe nature. Okay, what about the second fact that we only have a tiny menu of spins? Well, at, uh, so uh, given that we see that the this essential simplicity shows up at very short distances, um, let's let's imagine or very high energies again by the uncertainty principle, short distances and high energies are the same. Let's just imagine that we're imagining, uh, let's just imagine that we're looking at processes involving these particles at very, very high energies. You would naively think that at very high energies, we should be able to ignore the rest mass of the particles compared to everything else, right? So, um, so if the energy is much, much bigger than mc squared, you would think that, that that mass isn't mattering much. This is a very important and almost correct intuition. And the entire story of the Higgs is about how the intuition is a little bit wrong, right? <laughs> 
But let's, let's begin by, uh, by, by doing the most naive thing, which is to imagine we can forget about the mass when we go to very high energies. If I'm scattering two electrons at energies of 10,000 GeV, surely the measly mass that they have cannot possibly matter. All right, but this has one interesting consequence, which is that I told you the particles have spin, but, they have, but there's a more special kind of spin that they can have when they're massless. The only kind of spin we can talk about is the angular momentum that they have in the direction that they're moving. Okay? So uh, because if they're massless, they're moving at the speed of light. So we can talk about their angular momentum and their direction of motion and the angular momentum opposite to their direction of motion. We'll come back to it in a second, but for a massive particle, that's not true. Because no matter how fast they're moving, you can always go to a frame of reference where they're at rest. And if they're spinning this way by tilting your head in two other directions, you can see it spinning in other ways. But we can never go to a frame of rest where a massless particle is at rest. And therefore, we can't use that argument, and we can't conclude that it has all possible spins. In fact, the only spins we can conclude that it has are the spin that it has in its direction or opposite to its direction of motion. So the photon has a spin of 1 or minus 1 in its direction of motion. The graviton has a spin of 2 or minus 2 in its direction of motion, and so on. Okay? So that's sometimes called helicity. And also, of course, the energy and the momentum are essentially the same thing if we're, neglecting, uh, if we're neglecting the masses. All right. Now let's come back to what many of you might think of as the sort of simplest sort of interaction that we might have between particles. I'm, 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 I'm about to claim that, again, remember, the, the claim here is that what the interactions between particles are are almost completely nailed by relativity and quantum mechanics. So let's think about the simplest such interaction naively, which is two particles in, two particles out. Okay, so two particles in, two particles out. What could this depend on? And already you think this could be pretty complicated. It could depend on the energy in the center of mass frame of this collision, and it could depend on the angle with which the particles come out. So you could write down you know, any sort of complicated function you like of the energy and the angle, and it doesn't seem like we have much control over it, okay? just from first principles. But I just told you that's not actually the simplest interaction we can talk about. The simplest one we can talk about is ABC. Those are the only ones that we fundamentally have, and we have to build everything else by gluing them together. So let's think about that one. And automatically, you see life is much more interesting here. When you have a particle zooming at the speed of light, it's extremely simple to see by the conservation of energy and momentum that it can't break into two other particles moving at the speed of light that are coming off at some angle relative to it. Okay? It's a very simple exercise. All it can do is break up into two other massless particles that are moving in exactly the same direction as the original guy. Okay? So that's the only kind of process we could be talking about. So that means, first of all, there's no angle that it can depend on. Okay? This can't depend on, on any angle, because there's no angle. Okay? Now, could it depend on the energy? No, it cannot, because the energy also depends on the frame of reference. If you go to a different frame of reference, the energy will also change. So it can't depend on energy, and it can't depend on angle. What can it possibly depend on? Nothing. In fact, all it can depend on are the spins of the particles and nothing else. up to an overall constant. Okay, so up to an overall constant that measures the strength of the interaction, everything is completely nailed by just giving the spins of the particles. Again, that's a consequence of both relativity and, and quantum mechanics. And with one more basic uh, uh, requirement from quantum mechanics, that these amplitudes, which may be typically small, the only place they can become large is when what we normally think of as a virtual particle becomes real as a resonance phenomenon. So if we have these guys colliding, somewhere the only place it can get big is where they're actually producing some intermediate particle that goes from, from here to there. And remember, I told you these basic stick figures are totally known. Then we can completely constrain what even, to begin with, the two to two processes look like. And so this is now the basic requirement that you can hand uh, a good graduate student. You say, here are the rules. Here are the basic stick figure interactions. Can you build even the simplest consistent two to two process? Okay. They go, they study for about a year, and they come back with a remarkable answer. That is almost impossible. Okay. If you try to do it with random spins, you find it simply impossible to get an answer compatible with these basic principles. And the only things that you can do, even theoretically, forget about what the world looks like. Okay. Even theoretically, the only things you can do have particles of spin 0, half, 1, 3 halves, and 2. Okay? So that's all we can have to describe nature okay? at long enough distances. 
as I said, the spin two is totally unique, and it's gravity. Okay. You can have a bunch of these guys. You can have a bunch of these guys. Already, things get more and more special as you go in this direction. Okay. Uh, you can have a bunch of these guys, but they have to have very, very special kinds of, of, of interactions. This one is particularly interesting. We'll come back to it in a second. You can have at most eight of these guys. <laughs> okay. And then finally, they're, as I said, that one is totally unique. Right? That's the menu. Our world <clears throat> makes a choice, as far as we can see, from this menu. But I want to emphasize how far we've come since Newton. Okay? Newton, of course, uh, you know, started the entire endeavor, started the whole subject. But there's a continuous infinity of choices that you could make in describing nature using classical physics. You know, he brilliantly guessed that uh, the force of gravity was 1 over r squared. But nothing in the structure of classical mechanics would have changed if it was 1 over r to the 2.003. So there's a, in, there's a humongous number of possible choices that could be made. And we're now down to something where we have a small, discrete number of choices. Right? You pick from this menu, and you get to pick the strength of the interactions, and that's it. And again, prior to July 4th, the things in black were all that we had seen. OK. So now, what about the Higgs? As I said, the entire story about the Higgs is repairing a small bit of naivete in what we just did. We said that we should be able to, at very high energies, we should be able to ignore the masses of particles. Okay? So at very long distances, we have a world where we don't see the effects of massive particles other than through tiny interactions. At very short distances or very high energies, we should get to see them wandering around and get to treat them as massless particles. So you would think that naively, the world of the very large and massive, and the world of the very small and massless should smoothly merge one into the other. Okay? That's the naive expectation. And that expectation turns out to be false. Okay? For a subtle reason, that expectation turns out to be false. The purpose in life of the Higgs is this one particle addition uh, to what we've seen is all it takes to allow a smooth, uh, a smooth extrapolation of the world of the large and massive to the world of the small and massless. This is a very different way of talking about the Higgs than you've perhaps maybe seen in other places. Uh, often people use these absolutely horrendous metaphors and analogies. They talk about fields that fill the universe. If they're really bad, that's already pretty bad. If they're really bad, they talk about molasses and things banging into each other and so on. And, uh, and almost all of this is, I mean, some of it is a decent analogy. Some of it is just flat out wrong. Um, I want to tell you what's really precisely correct. And this is the precise, you know, in, in 100 or 200 years, I guarantee you, people will not be using those metaphors and analogies to talk about the Higgs. But what I'm telling you now is the actual purpose in life of the Higgs, and it will be the way it's described in, in uh, textbooks. OK, okay so, so what was so naive about what we're doing before? Well, there is one amazing difference between massive and massless particles. And that happens when particles have spin. So I told you that the W has a spin 1. <clears throat> but uh, because the W is a massive particle, it, has, it can spin in three directions. Right? Again, we can go to a frame where it's at rest. If it's spinning this way by tilting our head, we can see that it's spinning in, uh, in, in, in any of three directions. So there's three spin degrees of freedom associated with the W. But for a massless particle like the photon of spin 1, the same spin, for the massless particle, there's only two degrees of freedom spin 1 or minus 1 in the direction of the motion. So there's one extra guy. That's the fly in the ointment. The so simple just kinematics that at very high energies we should be able to ignore the mass is correct, but there is something that's missing. The, kin the, the degree of freedom counting is wrong. 3 is not equal to 2. There's one extra degree of freedom. And that degree of freedom ends up mattering. Remember I told you that the W and all these other guys have these nice dimensionless interactions that are small numbers so that the amplitudes are small. Right? The amplitudes for scattering are small. Unlike gravity, where the amplitude gets huge when you go to uh, very high energies compared to the uh, comparable to the Planck scale. But that's ignoring the following uh, important fact. So let's say we have the, uh, the uh, W. And it could be spinning this way or that way when it's at rest. But I'm going to boost it so that it's uh, moving very quickly in that direction. 
Now, I won't be able to explain this uh, precisely, so this is, a, a, this is a little bit of an analogy and a little bit of a cheat, but it's close to the spirit of the correct argument. You're all familiar with the fact that in, in relativity, things uh, don't get contracted or enhanced when they're perpendicular to the direction of motion. Okay? So the spins this way and that way, the sort of amplitude to find the W spinning this way or that way don't, doesn't get bigger or smaller as we boost it a lot. But there's one more component, the one where it's spinning in the direction in which it's boosted. You could call it the longitudinal component of the W. And that suffers a Lorentz enhancement. Okay? So the amplitude to find the W in that longitudinal polarization state, just as a kinematical fact, grows with energy. Okay? And at very high energies, it goes like the energy divided by the mass of the W, the only possible thing that it could be. So that means that, naively, we might have thought that when we scatter Ws against each other, that that amplitude is something small, around a percent. But if those Ws happen to be longitudinal Ws, there's a second piece. The, the, the basic strength of the interaction is a percent, but this kinematical fact makes the amplitude grow like the energy over the mass of the W to some power, squared. And then amazingly, we're back into the same trouble we, we had that we had with gravity. At some point, this amplitude gets big. But that isn't infinitely far away at the Planck scale. It's right above our head. If we, if we ask when this becomes of order one, it becomes of order one when the energy is around 1,200 GeV. Okay? Something similar happens for interactions of Ws and top quarks, which are the heaviest of the quarks that, were, uh, that was discovered in the mid-90s. Again, these amplitudes become nonsense uh, at energies comparable to around 1,000 GeV. So you, we might have had this naive expectation that if we go to high energies, we can just ignore all the masses, and nothing new is going to happen, well, maybe until we hit the Planck scale, and all hell breaks loose, right? Um, quantum mechanics and gravity and all the rest of that exciting stuff. That may have been a naive uh, expectation. Again, that's a naive expectation that the world of the massive and large smoothly connects to the world of the massless and small. But we just learned that that expectation is false because we have these particles, these massive particles, spin one particles like the W that mediate uh, the weak interactions. And the correct picture is actually that all hell is breaking loose already if we do nothing else. If we just take the particles that we've seen and loved and nothing else, all hell is breaking loose already just a factor of 10 above our heads. So this was the situation that theorists were uh, well aware of uh, already by the mid-1970s. In fact, sort of uh, ironically, th this, this aspect of the story was understood after the proposal of the actual Higgs particle. It's a great example of the way things actually work in science. You know, proposals and ideas are made long before it's quite obvious what they're good for or what the real purpose in, in life is. Okay. All right. So now, <clears throat> this sort of thing has happened in many other places in physics. I don't have time to go into it. But in many other parts of physics, this basic phenomenon happens, that you have some degrees of freedom that you see at long distances. And the interactions between those degrees of freedom get strong as you go to short distances. And they're then replaced by totally different dynamics that resolves them. Okay? Already, uh, this is very familiar in the case of the strong interactions. We're at long distances between protons and neutrons and pions. And the interactions between them are strong. And at short distances, they're not some proton prime and neutron prime and pion prime. They're quarks and gluons. Okay? So the idea that you have interactions that are weak, they get strong, and then things melt into a totally different description at short distances is a familiar one. And is the only way we've seen this work all the other places in nature where this phenomenon has shown up. This sort of phenomenon has shown up. So the most conservative thing to have expected is that the same thing is going to happen again. Nature repeats itself. And so you would have thought that these, what are the strongly interacting degrees of freedom now? They're these longitudinal Ws and Zs. And so you would have thought that just like pions are weakly interacting at, uh, at low energies and become strongly interacting at high energies and melt into quarks and gluons, that these longitudinal Ws and Zs would do the same thing. Okay? And in fact, people, when I said that, that the Higgs is shocking, it's shocking because it should have been something like that by all rights if it was mimicking uh, other examples of this phenomenon that we've seen in nature. Then something happened, though, in the, in the late 80s and early 90s. Some, some uh, wonderful theorists actually made a, made a prediction, uh, sort of a tour de force calculation, to make a prediction uh, based on this picture. 
go through it in detail, but if you just assume that there's nothing new happening up to around 1,000 GeV where things melt into totally different degrees of freedom, you get to make a prediction for tiny effects which modify, for example, the couplings of the Z bosons to, elect to uh, electrons and positrons. Okay? So these calculations were done, detailed theory calculations, and they gave rise to corrections that are around 1%, sort of what, what you'd expect, that, that size uh, correction to these couplings. Then our experimental friends did an even more tour de force uh, thing of actually going out and measuring exactly these, these, uh, these couplings, and they measured them to a tenth of a percent. Okay? And there was no sign of these 1% level deviations. So already in around 1991, it was clear there was something new about this physics, something essentially new about this physics. We couldn't wait till around 1,000 GeV in order to bring in something new and change the basic structure of this argument, that would have given rise to these 1% corrections, not 10 times smaller. So we already knew that something new had to happen, not just by 1,000 GeV, but quite a bit earlier than that. So what could it possibly be? Whatever it is, because these interactions aren't therefore getting strong, whatever it is, we have to have some new particles coming in that because the world is quantum mechanical and we get to add amplitudes, something new has got to come in that, that, that has to have a structure that cancels these growing amplitudes. Okay? So what could it possibly be? You could just draw sort of exactly the kind of stick figures that you could have. We know the menu that we're allowed to talk about. right? Now, the possible spins for this mis mystery x could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. For good reasons, it can't be half, 3 halves, 5 halves. So it can only be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, we can immediately cross off 3, 4, and higher because we can't have any of them by our general principles. We can cross off 2 because 2 is unique. It's the graviton. So we're left with spin 1 and spin 0. If it's spin 1, it's possible, and theories like that have been written down and people have studied them, but it has a bit of a Russian doll structure because to solve the problems with massive spin 1 particles, you're adding new massive spin 1 particles. So what's going to solve the problem with them? Right? So it's sort of turtles all the way down. Uh, and they also didn't work in detail. So we're left with one possibility, only one reasonable possibility where x has spin zero. Okay? When x has spin zero, it's called the Higgs. And what you see from this argument, totally independent, again, it has nothing to do with our desires of aesthetic beauty and the way we describe nature and so on. This thing has a job to do. It has to cancel these rapidly growing amplitudes. So the strength of the interaction of this x with w's and with top quarks is completely nailed. We know everything about that because of its purpose in life, because it has to cancel these things. So remember that. All right. And finally, at very high energies, this new particle x and the longitudinal components of the w and the z, together, those four degrees of freedom altogether, together are combined into one bigger object and this one bigger object has the kinds of interactions with massless Ws and Zs and, and photons and so on that it's allowed to have, these stick figure interactions that we talked about. So said for the fifth time, the purpose in life of the Higgs, and it's remarkable that all it takes is one extra particle, but this one extra particle, without the Higgs, not only doesn't the world of the large not melt into the uh, massive and large melt into the world of the massless and small, but the difference between them gets more and more magnified as you go to higher and higher energies. The single additional particle is all that you need in order to finally be able to have sort of a complete theory that we can extrapolate from very long distances to really arbitrarily short distances until we get close to the Planck scale where really totally new things happen. Okay. Okay, so that's a purely theoretical story. And I want to emphasize that it was a brave proposal because no fundamental spin zero particle had ever been seen before. We'll come back in a second to why that is and uh, um, wh why that likely is. But anyway, this had never been seen before. So this is a great, it's a great, uh, uh, it's a great illustration of the kinds of activity you're involved with as a theoretical physicist. It's possible taking physical principles about the world to get a picture for all possible things that could happen. That set is extremely restricted, as we've seen but it's still bigger than everything we have actually seen out there. So when there's a puzzling phenomenon, you can see, is there something in the suite of what nature can do that could be relevant for this phenomenon? In this case, 
The answer is yes. And so you say, even though no one's ever seen it before, the spin zero particle's got to be there, and we know roughly where it has to be, and we know the strength of all of his interactions ahead of time. Okay. And um, this, despite the fact that experimentalists kept looking forward and looking forward, and it was harder, hard to see, and there was a smaller and smaller window in, it, in which it could be seen, and you know, uh, never mind journalists. I talked to journalists about things like that, but I talked to people in other parts of physics, astrophysics and other areas, who would tell me, really, the Higgs is now nailed to this really narrow range, and you're telling us it's in there? Good luck, right? Uh, obviously, it isn't there, right? And we said, look, we're sorry. That's where we know it has to be. It's just really too bad that that's, that's particularly difficult to find it there, but that's life. But we know it has to be there. And uh, you know, I bet a year's salary that the Higgs would be discovered. <laughs> um, and many, many of my colleagues would have uh, made the same bet um, because, because of this, this, this entire picture. There's no other way that it could be. Okay. And of course, again, I'm going to truncate what, what was Jim's talk, uh, but at the LHC, uh, this particle was discovered with exactly the properties that it should have. I'll just say one thing about it, which is why we knew all the properties it should have at the LHC. The only thing we didn't precisely know about the, about the particle was its mass, but we knew everything else about it. Why? At the LHC, the Higgs is produced through the following rather indirect process because it has its biggest couplings to particles like the W and the top quark, not, which are not too common inside the proton. But when two protons collide at the LHC, what really happens is that two of the gluons at very high energies pop a top quark and anti-top quark out of the vacuum. And because the Higgs couples a lot to them, that produces a Higgs. Now, I want to emphasize that coupling between the Higgs and the tops was one of the things that was nailed by the point of life of the Higgs. So we knew everything about the rate at which the Higgs is produced. Now, how does it decay? Unfortunately, most of the time, the Higgs decays to a pair of bottom quarks. Okay. To have a rough idea, maybe around half a million Higgses have been produced at the LHC so far. So half a million is a pretty big number. Um, but uh, so you think, great, so we have a half million extra uh, bottom and anti-bottom quarks. Unfortunately, completely ordinary strong interaction processes give you, I don't know, billions of bottom anti-bottom quarks. So that extra 500,000 of them is just too tiny a blip to see. So despite the fact that we've made all that many Higgses, seeing it in this dominant channel is hard to see. But around 0.1% of the time, it decays in a, uh, in a more striking way um, uh, into a pair of photons. And again, how does it do that? It, it does that because it has this coupling to the Ws, and the Ws are charged and coupled to the photon in a known way. But that interaction is nailed. So the way it's produced is nailed, and the way that it decays, that's visible, is, and is rare, but we can see it, is nailed. That's why we knew everything about it other than its mass. Okay? And even the mass was known uh, to, a, uh, to, a reasonable, uh, to a reasonable window. All right, this is still tough to see, Still, there's a sort of a factor of 50 to 100 more photons produced by ordinary processes than via the Higgs. Uh, but it has the advantage that all those photons should pile up at one energy, basically. Or more properly, if you look at the, the, the effective mass that you would get from a pair of photons, they should all pile up at the mass of the Higgs rather than being spread out. Right. The Higgs is neutral, is electrically neutral. Okay. Otherwise, it would have been a lot easier, of course. <laughs> All right, and of course it was seen. Okay. So this is most obviously a triumph for experiment, but it's also a triumph for theory, and it shows you that these basic physical principles actually work. And that the belief in these principles paid off. So, so look at that. For, for 100 years, we knew about these guys, a half, one, and two of the allowed set, and now we get the color of the zero in black as well. So that's something that nature could do, that we hadn't seen it do, but now it does, and we know it does. All right. So that was uh, part one. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I'll have to be a little more brief about part two, um, but, um, uh, but I do want to tell you a little bit, at least about what the issues are, if, if that's okay. So, <clears throat> so you, you should now be completely convinced that we know what we're talking about. And now I'm going to tell you why, nonetheless, um, even though quantum mechanics and relativity largely make the universe around us inevitable, they also appear to make the universe around us impossible. Uh, 
And this comes down to the basic question, why is there a macroscopic universe? Uh, which is related to this idea of naturalness and what may or may not be correct about it. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> there's actually two aspects to the question, why is there a big universe? One of them is, why is the universe itself big? Why is there a macroscopic universe? One of them is, why is the universe itself big? Why isn't it curved and curled up, as in you would expect in, in general relativity, to really minuscule sizes close to the Planck length? Why is there this nice, big universe? And secondly, why are there big things in that big universe? There are big things like planets and elephants and things like that. Okay. And ultimately, these questions are, are related. They're both deeply mysterious. The mysteries related to them for the first one is called the, of why there's a big universe at all is called the cosmological constant problem. The second one is known as the hierarchy problem. Um, and I'll focus more on the second one here, uh, which really quickly turns into the question that why are the mass of the elementary particles so much smaller than the Planck scale, okay? <clears throat> if you do a nice little estimate for the size of a planet, this is a, back of, a classic back of the envelope estimate that you can do. What sets the size of like a rocky planet like the Earth? What sets it is equating the gravitational pressure that wants to crush it to the chemical pressures, right? The, the uh, atomic binding energies per atomic volume. If you equate those two pressures, you get an estimate for the size of the Earth. And it's a beautiful estimate because you find that the size of the Earth is the size of the atom multiplied by precisely the square root of the ratio of the strength of the electric force to the gravitational force between atoms. Okay. So planets are large to precisely the extent, right, for precisely the reason that gravity is weak. Okay. If gravity was strong, there would be one scale. Everything would be a black hole. Okay. The fact that we have such a huge wonderful diversity of scales in nature from the Planck scale all the way out to the size of the observable universe, those 60 orders of magnitude, that's directly related to the weakness of gravity. Okay? And the weakness of gravity, in turn, gravity wouldn't be weak if all the ele elementary particle masses were 15, 15 orders of magnitude heavier than they are. So the question quickly turns into a, a nice question. Why are the particles nearly massless compared to the Planck scale? This has to square up with something which uh, uh, I think Murray Gell-Mann first called the totalitarian principle in quantum mechanics, which is that you can't, you, you can't just say, well, it is what it is, right? You just set it and forget it, the strengths. Quantum mechanics tells you, because the world has, there's lots and lots of quantum fluctuations, that unless there's a good reason for something to happen, everything that can happen must happen, right? So keep these two facts in mind, and let's now ask why there are uh, light particles compared to the Planck scale. We'll first talk about the massless particles. Let's look at the photon. Why is the photon massless? Okay. Again, you might say, well, it's massless because it's massless, uh, but we know that we can think of the vacuum in, uh, in our world as sort of teeming with particles and antiparticles popping in and out of the vacuum. So this photon that's moving along is secretly having all of these complicated interactions with every possible charged particle in nature. So you know, if there isn't a good reason for the photon to be massless, these quantum mechanical corrections will make it massive. There's no, uh, that there has to be a good reason why it's massless. And there is a wonderful reason why the photon is massless. We've discussed it already. The photon is massless because two is not equal to three. Okay. A massless photon has two spin degrees of freedom. A massive photon would have three spin degrees of freedom. And there's nothing you can do by turning on these small interactions, there's nothing you can do to turn two discontinuously into three. Okay? So there's this interesting discontinuous difference between the number of degrees of freedom between massless and massive. The very thing whose flip side forced us to introduce the Higgs, right, uh, that explains why these particles can be massless, and it's perfectly fine. Okay? But now you see the problem. Exactly the thing that was exciting and really novel about the Higgs the fact that we've seen for the first time the spin zero particle also gives us a difficulty. We can't run the same argument. One is equal to one. The number of spin degrees of freedom of a Higgs, the number of degrees of freedom of a Higgs doesn't have any spin degrees of freedom, so the number of degrees of freedom of a massless and a massive spin zero particle are exactly the same. Okay. And so there's absolutely nothing to stop for any reason these quantum mechanical corrections for making the Higgs arbitrarily heavy. 
In fact, if, if nothing else, if there's no other scales we could imagine, remember, because of the Higgs now, for the first time, we can have a theory that we can, in principle, extrapolate all the way down to the Planck scale. We didn't have it before, but we finally have a theory that, that just theoretically is consistent to arbitrarily short distances. There's no reason why the Higgs shouldn't get dragged all the way up to the Planck scale. If it did, goodbye macroscopic universe, right? All the particle masses would be set by the Planck scale. We'd all be black holes, totally different world. So this is the question. Why isn't the Higgs enormously massive? Why isn't it up at the Planck scale? And the fact that no one had ever seen a spin zero particle in nature before was used by many people as a good support for this argument. This is why we haven't seen them, right? If they're out there, there would be, there's no good reason for them to be uh, light compared to the Planck scale. And yet from these more direct, still indirect, but these more direct experimental arguments I told you a while ago, we knew that there had to be this guy there, the Higgs, so that's the, that's the quandary we're in, right? We knew it had to be there, we finally found the damn thing, but why is it there? <laughs> By all rights, it shouldn't exist. Now, of course, I told you that we make all these wonderful predictions for the, uh, we know everything about the properties of the Higgs ahead of time, we can predict it, so surely this can't be a problem. And it's not a problem in the sense that there's something we can do in our theory to accommodate this fact, okay? And what we do is the following. We say, yes, there are these enormous quantum mechanical corrections to the mass of the Higgs, but there just so happens, let's say in some Planckian units, let's say in some Planckian units, there's a correction to the mass of the Higgs that's, uh, uh, that's uh, 2.374569 and so on. We say that there is another contribution to it which is negative 2.7, exactly the same things, and they agree to 30 decimal places, and they start disagreeing in the 31st decimal place. Okay. We can do that. Doesn't, nothing stops us from doing that. Um, but for good reasons, it's called fine-tuning. We have to fine-tune the parameters of the theory in order to explain something as basic as the existence of a macroscopic universe. There doesn't want to be a ma macroscopic universe, unless you very finely twiddle the dials of the parameters in order to make it do so. And again, this was taken by many people to explain why we've never seen something like the Higgs in a state of nature. Actually, we have seen physics much like the Higgs. We've seen particles of spin zero in other descriptions, in some description of the physics, in condensed matter systems all over the place. When you take a system and you tune it to be close to a second order of phase transition, uh, the sort of correlation lengths get longer and longer, and there's a good effective description of what the physics is in terms of a light scalar field. Okay? And the mass of that scalar field is much smaller than the typical interatomic spacings of the material that you're talking about. So you can get things that look you know, qualitatively like the Higgs. You engineer them all the time in these condensed matter systems. But you don't see it in a state of nature. In order to make it happen, there's someone outside the system with their finger on the dial, twiddling things and bringing the system close to, us, close to this phase transition. You pick up a hunk of metal uh, just sitting out there, it's not tuned to be close to the phase transition. You've got to do something to it to put it there. Okay. So that's what's extraordinary about discovering the Higgs. We're seeing, not in these condensed matter systems, in which we never see it in a state of nature, but in the vacuum of the universe, we're seeing something which the only other place we've seen it is when there was someone outside twiddling the dials. Okay. It's very strange. Now, <clears throat> there are antecedents to this kind of puzzle. Okay. It's not the first time we've run into this sort of puzzle in the history of physics. And <clears throat> a very good one, uh, um, a very good analogy goes back uh, to the beginning of the 20th century to the puzzle that uh, people like Abraham and Poincaré and Lorentz faced <clears throat> in trying to make sense of the electron, namely that there seemed to be an infinite energy stored in the electric field surrounding an electron. Okay. This, is an this is an exercise many of you are familiar with. If you estimate the energy stored in the electric field, it's linearly divergent. If you cut off uh, the integral uh, at some size a, <clears throat> and you ask what would that size have got to be in order for the energy to be comparable to mc squared of the electron, you get the scale known as the classical radius of the electron, and here's the formula for it, okay? And so these guys made an argument. They said that uh, something new has got to happen by then, because if it doesn't, 
will be in a very similar situation we were in before. There'd be a huge contribution to the mass of the electron that would have to be finally canceled against some other contribution, negative contribution, uh, in, order for, in order to see the observed mass of the electron, which seemed very strange. So that was the argument, and they even had a model for what it might be. The electron was a shell of some size given by a classical. Right? That model <coughs> was not correct. Uh, had lots of problems, and it wasn't correct. But the spirit of the argument was right. They were basically right. Something new did have to happen by then. But actually, what happened was quite a bit more dramatic than they had any right to expect. There was relativity in quantum mechanics. And there was, uh, um, uh, there was relativity in quantum mechanics. And so uh, we had this cloud of electrons and positrons surrounding the electron. Now, the typical size of that cloud is the Compton wavelength of the electrons and positrons. And if you work it out, you see that the Compton wavelength is roughly alpha inverse bigger than the classical radius of the electron. It's around 137 times bigger. So 137 times earlier than it had to come in, new physics came in. Very dramatic new physics came in. Okay? So they couldn't possibly guess what that new physics was, but the basic structure of the argument was right. They didn't want there to be this fine tuning in explaining the properties of the electron. Therefore, you have to predict new physics by some scale. You get an estimate for that, but for that scale by, you know, by saying where would you have to put it for the correction not to be to be comparable to the quantity that you're talking about, and not only did new physics come in when it had to, it came in earlier than it had to. Okay? So we're in a very similar situation with the Higgs today. Okay, it's almost exactly the same. It's almost exactly the same questions. In fact, there are two other examples in the last hundred years of exactly the same flavor. I won't go into it now. With exactly the same flavor, with a, where exactly the same kind of argument was made and was correct. Okay? So this idea is it's a doctrine known as naturalness, right? that we should not have fine tuning in the parameters of the theory, especially to explain very basic properties of the world, and especially to these ridiculous levels of accuracy, like one part in 10 to the 30. Uh, and this is not something that we invented in the last 30 years. Okay, that's what I want to emphasize. It's something which has come up before. I say this because it's possible that, this, that we're finally seeing an exception to this doctrine. It's not obvious, but it's possible. Um, but, I, but before saying that, I want to say that it's been used before and it's worked in the past. Now, if we apply this to uh, the uh, physics associated with the Higgs, the, the energy scale where you expect something new to happen is around hundreds of GeV, because that's the those are the energy scales associated with the Higgs and the W and the Z and all the rest of them. Okay, so that was the reason for an enormous amount of excitement about the experimental program of particle physics and of the LHC in particular. A, the Higgs would have to be discovered, uh, telling us you know large fraction of us that we're on the right track. Okay, but B it couldn't possibly be the whole story, because if it's just the Higgs and nothing else, we'd be left in this terrible fine-tuning situation. So great was people's aversion to thinking there might be fine-tuning that this was just an implicit assumption that that's not what was going to happen and we we're going to see something new. And the entire debate became about what that new thing might be. <laughs> okay? But there was an interesting tension right away, right when people first had these ideas in the uh, late 1970s and early 1980s, that if you expected all of this dramatic new physics at hundreds of GeV, even though people hadn't built, built accelerators to go there, it could show up indirectly. Okay? The virtual effects of these heavy particles could, could show up. And they could show up in lots of processes. These are technical things I won't go, go through, but baryon and lepton number violation, flavor and CP violations, and so on. So you'd expect some of these things to show up, and none of them were there. Okay? There was no indirect hints for any physics beyond what we'd seen. And in fact, if you were very naive and, and you took experimental limits from these processes, the scales that we're, that we're talking about that were being probed were much, much higher than hundreds of GeV, 1,000, 10,000 times higher, uh, maybe even higher than that. Okay? So that was an interesting tension right from the start. And, and people's attitudes back then, which may still end up being correct, <coughs> was that these aren't problems, but they're opportunities. They're telling us that it's not some random kind of new physics at hundreds of GeV. It's got to be a new physics with some interesting structure to it to hide itself <coughs> in all these other indirect ways in which it could have shown up. Okay. <coughs> now, what could it be? What could give us an explanation for why, there are, why something like the Higgs is, uh, is light compared to the Planck scale? <coughs> and again, 
um, if you're a theorist, you go back to, to, to look at what the universe could do um, and see if there's something in what it could do that we haven't uh, seen. And there's one last gap in this menu that we talked about, right? The, the set of possibilities were 0, 1 half, 1, 3 halves, and 2 for the spins of the particle. We haven't seen 3 halves. So let's talk about what the 3 halves could be. It turns out that if you want to have massless particles of spin 3 halves, again, that's some approximation. So we imagine at very high energies, uh, <clears throat> we can think of the particles as massless. If you want to have these particles of spin 3 halves, they have to have a very, very special property. And the universe has to have a very, very special property. <clears throat> and that property is known as supersymmetry. This is something that you may have heard about before in, in talks, but I want to emphasize um, that uh, it's not often talked about in this way. The reason so many theoretical physicists are excited about supersymmetry is not because they've spent 30 years working on it or they think it's aesthetically beautiful or even though the word symmetry is there. It's that it's the last thing nature can do at long distances that we haven't seen it do. Okay? So it sort of exists as this thing compatible with the basic principles of relativity and quantum mechanics and the last thing um, that uh, nature can do that we haven't seen it do. Okay, and it turns out that in order to have these massless particles of spin three halves, <coughs> you really, you, you have to have a very special structure. Um, for instance, w if we have electrons or spin a half particles coupling to the graviton, this spin three halves particles has got to be thought of as a partner of the graviton. And in fact, the only way it's consistent is if there is another particle of spin zero differing from the electron with spin a half, so of spin zero, uh, the couples to the electron and this spin three halves partner. So all spin a half particles have to have a partner of spin zero. All spin one particles have to have a partner of spin a half. These super partners are to ordinary particles that we've seen a little bit like antimatter was to matter 100 years ago or 80 years ago. Okay? And it's actually associated with a similar kind of extension to our picture of space time. So it would be quite poetic if something like this ended up uh, being true. Oh, let me tell you also. Um, oh, and, and uh, for this all to make sense, uh, they really have to be partners in, in the sense that, you know, two electrons can interact with a photon. So there has to be exactly the same strength interaction between the electron, the superpartner of the electron, and the superpartner of the photon called the photino. Okay, so they all have to be closely related to each other. I will skip that. So <coughs> supersymmetry is the last consistent possibility. <clears throat> There's a way of thinking about it which actually extends our notion of what space-time are that, uh, uh, to make it a little more quantum mechanical. That's the slide that I skipped. <clears throat> but how does it solve the Higgs problem? It solves the Higgs problem because the Higgs, which is a particle of spin zero, ends up having a partner that has spin, that does have spin, spin a half. Okay. And so remember, the second a particle has spin, it's okay. It's possible for it to be massless compared to the Planck scale. The problem was it was spin zero. But supersymmetry forces the spin zero and the spin a half particles to be related to each other. In fact, if supersymmetry was exact, they would be exactly equal in mass. So the masslessness of the spin a half partner of the Higgs guarantees the masslessness of the Higgs itself. Okay. So it's the last thing that the world can do. No one asked, no one asked for it. Right? It's the last thing the world can do, and it can solve the Higgs problem. And it does it for this very simple and beautiful reason. <clears throat> All right. Then there are some more indirect, uh, there are more indirect uh, circumstantial evidence that something like uh, supersymmetry might be correct uh, related to the, the fact that this actual precise strength of the interactions of, of the strong weak and electromagnetic forces seem to converge to one number quite accurately at very high energies. It only happens with supersymmetry, but I won't go through that in more detail. The most dramatic thing is that it solves this, this uh, naturalness problem. Okay. <clears throat> now, there's, there's been, of course, and, and discovering supersymmetry has been on the radar for experimentalists, um, and this, one of the central programs of the LHC is searching for these uh, super partners of the ordinary particles that we've seen. Now, we haven't seen any yet. Okay. And so, um, uh, so, a number of people are saying, oh, so, so supersymmetry is dead, right? So, um, and uh, so we, we haven't seen any of the superpartners yet. Um, they could have shown up, which is true. Um, and there are two things to say about that. First of all, uh, we're of course not nearly done at the LHC, and we're going to uh, double the energy um, <coughs> starting in 2015. 
the rate for producing new particles scales roughly as the sixth power of energy, so that factor of two is a really big deal uh, and is going to extend our reach a lot, so it's possible the super partners are out there. Um, uh, yet to be seen, we're sort of in the, you know, the kind of middle of the parameter space where it, it, where it, it could be, so it's, uh, it's not, it could be given what we knew before, so, uh, so it's pretty reasonable. But there's actually a second part of that story, um, which is that it's not true that, uh, you know, that, that the theorists were totally confident that something like supersymmetry should be seen until these experimental results from the LHC, and now we're nervous. There has actually been reason for 25 years already, uh, 23 years, and growing more with time to be worried about the idea of supersymmetry at, at low energies. Okay? And <clears throat> so, um, so it's actually not the case that at least many of us are, are not actually surprised that it hasn't been seen yet because, and we've been saying for a long time <laughs> that uh, you know, there might be something a little wrong here because um, a thousand GeV scale is not the energy scale at which supersymmetry really should have been seen if it solves this naturalness problem. It should solve this naturalness problem in a big way, the way these problems have been solved in the past, earlier than they need to be solved. And the problem is that not only haven't they been solved earlier than they need to, it's getting more and more postponed. So the real difficulty, or the real issue, uh, and I want to emphasize, it, you know, it may be that, it may be that we, we turn on the machine in 2015 and all these particles are there, and there is just a, there's a, there'll be a sort of small lingering mystery for a long time why it took so long for them to show up, but people won't care. Uh, at least they won't care for 10 or 20 years and then they'll go and start obsessing about it again, okay? Um, but I want to tell you why it was that many of us were worried about this. Okay? And the reason is that supersymmetry, the LHC was not the machine that should have discovered supersymmetry. It should have been discovered much, much earlier. Already in the very early experiments uh, uh, in, uh, in the previous accelerator at CERN at LEP. The real question is why wasn't su supersymmetry seen in 1990? <coughs> in, 19, in that period, Z bosons were being produced uh, at the plus E minus uh, collisions at CERN. And there was every reason to expect, from a theoretical point of view, that the spectrum would have had particles like the Z, the superpartners of the top quarks and the gluons, as well as the Higgs. And it's the, uh, the reason why the Higgs sh should be up, up here, the Higgs and the Z should be up here, is that they have significant interactions with the uh, top quarks uh, and their superpartners. And for good reasons, the particles that are strongly interacting tend to be heavier than the particles that aren't in supersymmetric theories. So you would have expected a spectrum that had the Z and the Higgs and maybe some of these other particles closer to the top of the spectrum, and then some of the particles that aren't strongly interacting, the superpartners of the electron and the muon, the W and the Z bosons, lighter. Okay. Theorists were writing papers in 1990 with spectra that had 40 GeV sleptons. Okay. Stops. Uh, superpartners on the top at 150 GeV, 200 GeV. And they weren't doing this because they were wild optimists about what was going on. You sort of open these supersymmetric models out of the box. You ask for them to solve uh, this naturalness problem. That's what they want to look like. Okay? And so that's what to a theorist would have been a natural spectrum. But the more proper use of the word natural, namely nature -ol, <laughs> what nature actually gives us, seems to look exactly the other way around. The Z and now the Higgs are near the bottom of the spectrum, and we haven't seen anything else yet. <clears throat> now, there's another link, beautiful link, between supersymmetry and the Higgs. You remember, every particle has got to have a superpartner. So the Z particle, for example, which is a neutral, this, remember, had three spin degrees of freedom. It has to have a partner, which is a particle of spin a half, like, like the electron. Um, not the electron, so its partner is called the Zeno, and it's easy to count that that guy has four spin degrees of freedom. Again, the electron itself has two spin degrees of freedom, and its antiparticle has two spin degrees of freedom. There's a total of four spin degrees of freedom for this guy. So now the problem is that four is not equal to three. And in order for the degrees of freedom to match, you have to have one additional neutral boson. That additional neutral boson is the Higgs in supersymmetric theories, right? So, so here's the Higgs and the Z together. Their superpartner is this Zeno. And that tells you something, that in a supersymmetric theory, the mass of the Higgs should be tied to the mass of the Z. 
In fact, if supersymmetry were exact, then the mass of the Higgs should equal the mass of the Z. In a little bit more detail, <clears throat> it turns out that there is a nice expression that tells you the mass of the Higgs should actually be lighter than the mass of the Z, plus what should be small corrections. Okay? These small corrections, <clears throat> given the fact that supersymmetry is broken, of course, we don't have uh, the, the, the superpartners are, are heavier than the particles that we've seen. Supersymmetry is not an exact symmetry. It's sort of restored as we go to very short distances, but it's not an exact symmetry. And so you expect there to be this correction to this relationship. The problem is that as you make the superpartners heavier and heavier, the price of this fine tuning gets dramatically worse and worse. Okay? Like, as in the electron, there's this linear divergence to the mass of the Higgs. But this correction is to a dimensionless quantity and is minuscule, it grows logarithmically. <laughs> so if you want to make the Higgs, you know, every few GeV that you make it heavier than the Z, you're doubling the amount of fine tuning that you have to do. Right? And that's what's so interesting about the actual mass the Higgs was finally discovered at, at around 125 GeV. 125 GeV is close enough to the mass of the Z, which is 90 GeV, to smell like supersymmetry, but it's far enough away uh, to start looking pretty fine-tuned if you wanted to interpret it in a supersymmetric way. And in fact, the sort of degree of fine-tuning <coughs> that you'd have to tolerate is getting to be an order of the sort of 1% level. Okay? So the fine adjustments that we have to make, if we turn on the machine, we see all this stuff, right? Uh, still, it's, it's quite plausible that we'll end up talking about a sort of fine adjustment of the underlying parameters at the order of a few percent in order to explain just why the Higgs ended up where it was. Okay. Now, it could be that as, as theorists, we're still missing something, some beautiful mechanism that uh, nature has up her sleeve that we haven't thought about yet. Again, it would have to lie within that basic rubric that I told you about, but that rubric is so rich uh, with, with possibilities that, that it keeps uh, surprising us in what it can do. So it's possible that we are missing something. And I, I do want to emphasize that there are some goalposts that cannot be moved, completely independent of our imagination as theorists. If supersymmetry actually provides a solution to this fine-tuning fine problem, there are two particles that absolutely must be seen. There's a superpartner of the top quarks that must be seen, and in turn, the superpartner of the gluon has to be seen, and they have to be there. The superpartner of the top has got to be lighter than around 400 GeV. The superpartner of the gluino has got to be lighter than around 1200 GeV. And if they get much heavier than that, you have an unavoidable degree of fine tuning that we can quantify by these ratios. Okay. So, the, so seeing nothing at the LHC is actually the biggest shock of all. Okay. Seeing nothing other than the Higgs at the LHC is starting to prove something to us quantitatively that the physics at this scale is fine-tuned. We've never seen it before in nature, but the physics at that scale really looks fine-tuned, and it begins to quantify the degree of what that fine-tuning is. Or we'll see something. Okay? Right now, the experimental limits from the LHC on these particles are right around this, this range. Okay? So, um, so the sort of bottom line summary is that those of us who are concerned about low-energy supersymmetry are not particularly much more concerned now than we were uh, up to this point, given the LHC results. But the situation will change in 2015. Okay? The situation will change when, when we go to twice the energy at 2015. And if we don't see these particles, again, the LHC should eventually be able to get us to the sort of 1% level tuning for uh, what, what uh, uh, um, uh, for, for, for physics at this scale. All right. I framed this discussion in the context of supersymmetry, but it's a much broader point. Okay? And this is, I think, the really, the really exciting thing. Um, what's really being put under pressure is not one particular model or other, but this entire paradigm that was uh, ingrained uh, and just implicitly assumed by most people in the 90s that there would be a natural so solution to these problems. It's that broad idea of naturalness that's being put under more pressure by the LHC. Supersymmetry is one, perhaps the best, the most promising example of what such physics might look like, but it's really that broad idea that is being uh, put, uh, put, up, put to the test. And so let me just take two minutes and, and I'll end um, to, uh, to, to, to paint a sort of completely different picture of the world um, that could be uh, responsible for some of these uh, fine tunings that we're seeing 
again, just to sort of highlight the, uh, the sort of level of, of drama of the, of, the, of the choices at stake. There was another reason. So th there, there were two reasons, uh, uh, well, there were sort of two reasons um, uh, why there was some worry about this idea of naturalness even before the LHC. They're all sort of small ball, little detailed things. Why didn't we see all these indirect effects of new physics? Why, wasn't, uh, why weren't the superpartners seen already at uh, LEP? Why, was the, why wasn't the Higgs lighter and so on? These are sort of little nagging issues on the one hand. But on the other hand, there's this big elephant in the room that's been sitting there the entire time for all these arguments. <clears throat> and that is that we've been uh, obsessing about the question of why there are big things in a big universe. But there's a more zeroth order question, why there's a big universe to begin with. <laughs> And the question of why, the big, why there's a big universe to begin with is much more dramatic and has no solution uh, along the lines that we are, were expecting to see for the Higgs. This is known, again, this is the famous cosmological constant problem, and it has to do with the question of the energy density in the vacuum. So quantum fluctuation should give the vacuum some energy density. Um, uh, and um, we can make an estimate for what that energy density is. Uh, the quantum fluctuations get bigger and bigger as we go to smaller and smaller distances. If we go all the way to the Planck scale, there should be Planckian energy density and a Planckian volume, giving us a Planckian cosmological constant and a curvature of the universe that's Planckian. The only word I said was Planck in that sentence. So that would mean that the curvature should be 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, or the universe should be explosively uh, accelerating, doubling in size every 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Totally nothing like the universe that we see around us. And so what we have to do is imagine that there's a fine cancellation of, the, uh, of two contributions to the vacuum energy that are now accurate to one part in 10 to the 120, not this measly one part in 10 to the 30. Okay? So explaining the most basic fact about our universe, that it's big, never mind has big things in it, forces us to finally adjust the parameters of our theory to one part in 10 to the 120. That's the biggest failure of a back of the envelope estimate in the history of physics. And it's particularly jarring to a subject where we're used to, you know, 12 decimal agreement between theory and experiment when, 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 when we can do uh, the theoretical calculations and do the experiments. So what the heck is going on? You could make the same kind of argument and say, ah, so what we should expect some new physics at some scale, <laughs> right? But what is the scale? The scale associated with the vacuum energy is 10 to the minus three electron volts or around a millimeter. So if you believed in naturalness, you would predict that there's new physics at a millimeter to, to solve the problem of this vacuum energy. We can all do the experiment. Nope, there's no new physics in a millimeter. <laughs> okay? Said another way, imagine that we are creatures not like us, but there are creatures made out of other kinds of atoms. And the size of those atoms were, I don't know, hundreds of kilometers, right? So these creatures are out there. They eventually you know, become sentient. They study the universe. They study cosmology. Uh, they discover the universe is expanding and all the rest of it. They see there's a cosmological constant. It's making the universe accelerate. They wonder, why the heck is a cosmological constant so small? And someone comes up with a brilliant idea that there's going to be supersymmetry at the millimeter scale. Supersymmetry could also solve this problem. Okay? That's, uh, supersymmetry really beautifully solves the problem of why there's a macroscopic universe when it's unbroken, when it's exact. It's the only framework we know of that allows you to get a macroscopic universe even theoretically, never mind whether the world looks like it. Okay? So, so someone would have that brilliant idea. Then they'd go build the large millimeter collider, right? <laughs> to go there and see that these, uh, these super partners are there in the millimeter, there's nothing there. Right? So the idea of naturalness has colossally failed when it comes to thinking about the vacuum energy. It's not a small ball issue, it's a big issue. Of course, it doesn't mean that it's going to fail for the other problem. After all, the cosmological constant problem was also sitting there 100 years ago. People didn't know about it, but it was sitting there 100 years ago. And it, it should not have stopped Abraham and Poincaré and Lorentz and those people from predicting that something new happens with the electron, right? But anyone who knows anything about the history of physics knows that you can, uh, you can you know, choose a, 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 an example from history to illustrate any polemical point you want to make. Uh, but but it's, it's possible that, uh, that it's going to happen a different way now. And there's a whole story that I don't want to, I won't have time to go into here um, about the sort of a, a, a different picture of the world that, um, uh, 
uh, that, that might explain this kind of thing. Let, let me not go, go through this in too much detail, but maybe I will um, just uh, stick with that picture. So <clears throat> there's a sort of totally different possibility that what we see in the universe around us now, out, you know, to, out of 10, 15 billion light years, this is only a tiny part, and which looks roughly homogeneous on these scales, right? That's the big, one of the big first realizations in cosmology is that the universe at large scales is homogeneous, is that if somehow in your mind's eye you zoomed out even further, you would actually see eventually the universe is incredibly inhomogeneous. And there are zillions of different possible environments, where zillions means 10 to the thousand, or maybe even more, of different possible uh, realizations of exactly the same underlying theory. That's, that's the idea. There's one simple underlying theory, but this underlying theory uh, could be string theory. This underlying theory can have tons of solutions, exponentially many solutions. It's very easy for a simple theory to generate exponentially many solutions. Uh, and that's the idea. There's sort of exponentially many different ways of realizing the same set of un underlying laws. But all these different ways of realizing it will, will have a universe with different numbers of electrons. Again, it's the same menu over and over again, right? Exactly the same menu over and over again, but the particular menu and the particular strengths of the interactions can vary from place to place. And if there's enough of them, 10 to the thousand of them, you can have so many that just statistically, accidentally, some of them will have the vacuum energy small enough by that fine coincidence, right? But uh, there's so many of them that happens. Okay? Now, why should we be there? You would still think, OK, great, that can happen accidentally. But surely, more typically, we won't be there. We'll be somewhere where the accident doesn't happen. Well, this is, this is a very uh, interesting fact that was first observed by Steve Weinberg in the late 1980s, that if you took our universe and you make the vacuum energy just a little bit bigger, it would completely change what it looked like. Uh, the reason is that uh, it, it would cause the universe to, uh, a large vacuum energy causes the universe to accelerate, and it would blow apart structure before it ever had a chance to gravitationally bind. That's where structure in our universe comes from, right? Eventually, you know, the universe gets colder and colder, matter dominates over radiation, and that matter clumps into big structures that clump more and more and more, eventually give rise to galaxies and planets and stars and us. Um, but if there's a, a cosmological constant, uh, before these things start clumping, they get blown apart by the, by the acceleration of the universe. And therefore, in those places, the universe is empty. So, so the vast majority of, of this multiverse in this picture is lethal and empty. And the only places you're going to find anything, often people call this reasoning the anthropic principle, but that seems to put human beings at the center of determining the laws of physics. I, I hope it's clear that it's exactly the other way around. You know, our importance in the grand scheme of things is diluted by a factor of 10 to the 500 or 10 to the 1,000 in this picture, right? And it's simply that in all the other places, there's nothing. The only places there is anything are going to be the places that appear to have these conspiracies in them, uh, uh, but that's, it is the way it is because we can't be anywhere else. Just like you know, we're on a little rock, the volume the Earth occupies compared to the universe is you know, 60 orders of magnitude smaller than the volume we could have in our Hubble. But it's not considered a pressing problem of theoretical physics to figure out why we're there. Where else could we be? Right? We're going to be on little, little, little rocks. We can't be in the middle of nowhere. Okay? So this is a, it's a completely different sort of picture. Um, that apparent fine tunings could just be apparent and reflecting the fact that we live in, in a tiny part, we live where we can live in a tiny, uh, in an enormous, uh, mostly lethal and empty multiverse. And if something like this is true, it's a huge change in perspective. It's sort of Copernican. Um, but it's by no means clear that this picture makes sense. Okay? Never mind whether it's experimentally true, it's by no means clear whether it makes theoretical sense. There, there turn out to be lots and lots of thorny conceptual paradoxes associated with making sense of a picture like this, largely associated with the fact that light from those other parts of the multiverse can never make it to us. And so uh, the only person, it's some, only some meta god's eye that could see all of this. But it seems very important that, uh, that individual observers can't actually directly get signals from out there. Okay? So, your, so your first thought would be, therefore, somehow it's got to be garbage, and we shouldn't talk about them. But in other closely related situations, 
making predictions from inflation, for example, the sorts of predictions that were recently reconfirmed to greater accuracy by the Planck satellite. In making those kinds of theoretical predictions, theorists do exactly that kind of thing. You extrapolate things that naively go outside. In those cases, they, they eventually come back and are accessible to late time observers. But those calculations are fine, and they give you the right answer. So it can't just be totally garbage to throw things out, which are out there. That's why it's, it's interesting. We don't know the answer. There are arguments for and arguments against. But uh, it's not a polemical or a philosophical question about whether you like the anthropic principle or not. It's a physics question, very hard physics question, about trying to make theoretical conceptual sense of this uh, very strange and remarkable long distance picture of space star. Okay? Uh, and so we don't know yet whether it makes any sense or not. But it's possible that something like this is going on. And it's actually interesting that there is a plausible anthropic, or the better word is environmental, argument for why the Higgs is where it is. It turns out if you did nothing else to the theory, but you change the parameter that controls the mass of the Higgs, if you just make it a little bit bigger, just three times bigger, it makes, pushes up all the masses of the quarks and the leptons. And it makes the down quark even heavier than it already is compared to the up quark, uh, such that if you just scale it up by a factor of three, the down quark gets so much heavier than the up quark that the neutron-proton mass difference exceeds nuclear binding energies. And there's no atoms. There's only hydrogen. The fact in our universe that we have this interesting, complicated set of nuclei is reflecting a, a very interesting accident between different uh, uh, fundamental parameters, which is very sensitive. Okay, it's very sensitive. And if you change things even a little bit, that accident is gone. So you could think that as a subdominant part of this multiverse picture, mostly the universe is lethal and empty. That's why the vacuum energy has got to be tiny, and that solves the cosmological constant problem. Then as a detail on top of that, even in those regions which it's not empty, there's nothing other than hydrogen, except in a further tiny set of regions where you get to, by this accident, have complicated uh, nuclei and atoms, and that may be where we are. Okay? Again, this may or may not uh, be the case, um, but there's at least a story that you can tell for us. Okay. Now, let's say we see the Higgs in nothing else. Um, we might get to around point to 1% fine tuning uh, at the LHC at planned energies. If the LHC doubles or more its energy eventually, we might get to something like 0.1% fine tuning. Okay? So we might get evidence for that degree of fine tuning uh, you know, on the 10 or 20 year time scale. And this is why, again, I want to stress, this is a, conceptually, it's a win-win situation. Right? Either we see a whole lot of new physics, supersymmetry, or maybe something else, and we learn that this idea of naturalness was correct for the fourth time, and, uh, and, and, and everything is great, and we learn, uh, if it's supersymmetry, we complete the menu of possibilities, and it's all wonderful, or we don't. And if we don't, it's even more dramatic. <laughs> it's, a bigger, uh, it's a bigger perturbation to our thinking. And while it by no means proves that there's a multiverse at all, um, it's another important, I think it would be an important piece of circumstantial evidence for something like that. And there are intermediate possibilities, but I won't talk about them here. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, let me just end by, by just repeating what I said. Um, this question, so first we discovered the Higgs, fantastic, we're, on the, we're broadly on the right track. But then it's very confusing that it's there, and it brings up this, this question of naturalness. To my mind, this question, is the Higgs natural, is the central question that we're going to uh, get an answer to, one way or the other, um, in this decade. And I hope I've convinced you that it's, uh, the answer is bifurcatory. Okay? It's not, there, there are two radically different pictures of the world, maybe others that we haven't thought of yet, but at least two radically different pictures of the world that are at stake. Uh, and um, at least among the pictures that we're talking about, you can really think of it as a, as a choice between order and chaos. Okay? Um, if we, we might see all this new dynamics uh, that solves fine tuning problems and so on, or we might get more circumstantial evidence that just like for the cosmological constant, there seems to be nothing solving uh, the question of the uh, lightness of the Higgs, and it would give us more circumstantial push towards taking this multiverse picture seriously. Um, but as I said in the beginning of the talk, uh, we're not going to be able to give talks like this uh, much longer. Um, and you know, if by the end of 2015 we, we, we don't see pretty good evidence for uh, supersymmetry, then I think we will 
as theorists, will for the first time be significantly more worried <laughs> than we were up to this point. And we're already worried. We've been significantly more worried than we were up to this point. And you know, by, by, by 2020, after the, the, uh, the uh, dust settles, I think we'll have some, some you know, not necessarily definitive, uh, well, we won't know, we'll never know definitively this picture for a long time. But there's much, much more that needs to be done to even make uh, mathematical sense of it. Um, but if we see lots of new physics of the sort that we expect, we, we might know definitively that we're in this camp. Um, uh, and as I said, we might worry on the 20 year time scale why it took so long to get there, but no one will, will worry about that uh, for 20 years. But if we don't see anything, um, we're, we're going to have to take this uh, picture more seriously. And so stay tuned. Hopefully someone will come and give you a, uh, you know, a proper one hour length talk when we know what's going on. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Nima, for a very educational as well as stimulating uh, uh, discourse on the state of state of the art right now. So, do we have some questions for for Nima? Yes, I, I mean, uh, dark matter is. Um, <clears throat> uh, people talk a lot about about, uh, well, first, there's probably dark matter in, 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 in the universe. You know, we don't know 100%, but there's extremely good, very, very good indirect uh, evidence for it. Um, uh, only one night out of 200, I worry that there isn't dark matter. <laughs> uh, but, uh, um, but I do worry about it one night every 200. Um, so yeah, so there's very likely dark matter. And um, if you ask the sort of uh, garden variety cosmologist, um, you know, what, what could be dark matter? You know, it, you invent any, any particle that you want. It can be a particle, it could be a rock, it could be a Winnebago, it could be anything you want, and you adjust its uh, density for a mass, you adjust its density to give you the needed density in the universe, okay? So that part of the story is very unconstrained. It shouldn't be electrically charged, but uh, it can't have, you know, large interactions with matter, but other than that, it's totally unconstrained. However, there is something that you can do that, at least theoretically, that removes that uncertainty and allows you to make a calculation. Okay, um, it doesn't mean the world has to work that way, but it's uh, but it's uh, something uh, but it's something very canonical you can do. Um, the reason why we have this uncertainty um, is we don't know what the number density of dark matter is because that seems to be set by the initial conditions. How much you have now depends on how much you had early in the universe. There's only one way we know of to remove that uncertainty which is to imagine that the dark matter was once in thermal equilibrium with everything else. If once upon a time it was in thermal equilibrium with everything else, then we know its initial density, right? Because we know compared to the density of all the other particles, which, which, which we know now. So if you do that, you can then make a calculation for how much of this uh, dark matter is left today. And if you ask the cosmologist, they will give you a sort of a, a range of masses and cross sections uh, to expect for that particle. And this is the sort of famous calculation that amazingly gives us the same weak scale. You know, hundreds of GeV, thousands of GeV, tens of GeV. You know, there's a, there's a range of about a factor of 10 to 100 in the mass and 100 to 1,000 in the cross section. But it's amazing. Could have been anywhere over, you know, 100 orders of magnitude. But it turns out to be right around where it's needed, okay? Oh, sorry, right around uh, exactly the same scale as we we're talking about. So if you believe in naturalness, uh, then, then you say, look, this is incredible. We have one set of purely theoretical arguments about the macroscopic universe that tell us that we need to have new particles at hundreds of GeV. Meanwhile, these totally other community, cosmologists looking at the universe on large scales, tell us we need some new particles at hundreds of GeV. So it could be that the new particles we need from the point of view of naturalness contain amongst them some that could be the dark matter of the universe. And that's, that, that's correct. Lots and lots of theories for new physics um, have some stable neutral particle in them. For example, in supersymmetry, a candidate could be the superpartner of the photon. Uh, it's, it's kind of nice that the, it's the partner of light, which would be the dark matter. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but that's 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 all the all the uh, has all the properties needed for dark matter. So that's perfectly perfectly possible. I didn't focus on it because um, because you know dark matter is very important. It's out there in the universe probably. Um, and it's great to know what is and so on, 
But in this talk, I was sort of focusing on the more structural questions about, about, uh, about, about the laws of physics. Dark matter is not very important in the grand, in, from that point of view in, in, in the grand scheme of things. It's you know, one component of this mess of new particles that sh should be there to make things natural if you have that picture of the world. But you know, even if we don't have that picture of the world and someone discovers, uh, uh, someone actually, regardless of all this, discovers some particle that has the properties of the dark matter, we'll know almost immediately what to do with it, how to identify it, you know, how to, how to, how to uh, put it in the, the framework we have. That's the, the sort of bigger point I was trying to make is that almost all the questions about dynamics, you know, um, we have such a good control on that, uh, that, that, that we've, we've, we've moved on to a, to, to, to a higher order question. Anything that we see is going to be described in this basic framework of quantum field theory. Okay? I didn't call it quantum field theory, but that's, that's what this union of relativity and quantum mechanics is. It's, it's incredibly, I mean, that would be the biggest revolution of all if we discover something that we can't des describe in that framework. But it's so, I mean, it, that, that, I, that, that I would give essentially zero probability to. That's how well we understand the world. It wasn't true 50 years ago or 100 years ago. People that didn't know what the broad framework was. Now we know what the broad framework is. But the questions that are left, and in a sense, it would be very depressing. What would be depressing is if we had seen um, lots of complicated, strong interactions instead of the Higgs. Because, um, I mean, it would be wonderful. Some people would enjoy studying that dynamics for a long time. But it would sort of prove that our universe going from one scale to another really was like peeling back layers of the onion. And there was nothing essentially new about it. That's why it's so remarkable that we've seen something as simple as the Higgs. Because uh, while we see that this basic framework is robust and correct, uh, we're seeing a very strange representative of it. Okay? We're seeing a very, very strange representative of it that either tells us we're, we're, we're missing still extra principles like, like supersymmetry uh, or, or its ilk. Um, or even more shockingly, that, uh, that, that somehow we definitely do not have a garden variety universe. <laughs> definitely. Even though the laws are, are sort of robust and, and, and understood, we have an extremely special and strange and finely adjusted choice. That, that's, I think, the sort of bigger uh, question. Um, and dark matter has a role to play in the story, but, uh, and it's very important, um, but it's not, uh, it's not it's not particularly central to that conceptual question. Yes, thank you. So, along that line of Higgs motion, wondering if you saw the same thing as Einstein or Higgs? Yes. Well, pick any number you want in the exponent. Yes. That, the, Well, it, 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 mostly they wouldn't. That, 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 that would be the idea. That would be the idea. In fact, the vast majority, in fact, we, we can make the, an, an estimate, but the vast majority of them, the universes are crumpled up near the Planck scale. Okay? Now, one ten thousandth of them, uh, the curvature scale is 100 times bigger than the Planck scale. One one millionth of them, it's 1,000 uh, times bigger than the Planck scale. Okay? Uh, so you have to get down to one tenth of the 120th of them uh, is, uh, is the one that gives us the kind of curvature scales that we see in our universe today. Right? So, so that's why Weinberg's argument was so striking, because had it been that we could take the vacuum energy in our world and make it 20,000, you know, five orders of magnitude bigger and not change anything, uh, then, then it would seem like that's not enough uh, to explain why, why it has the value that it has. But the fact that we're right up next to this dangerous boundary where the structure of the world changes so dramatically on the other side is striking. Now, the counter to that is uh, that, well, still, that seems like an awful long way to go, 10 to the 120, right? Why can we imagine that we change other things, uh, and maybe we can change more things and then tolerate a much, much bigger vacuum energy? And it's true, it's possible. If you allow yourself to change more things other than just the value of the vacuum energy, yeah, it's all out the window. You could you could make things much, much bigger. Of course, you could never go all the way to the Planck scale. You're always talking about some degree of tuning, but, uh, uh, but it looks like you, you wouldn't have to tolerate as much. Okay? So we, we just don't know. I mean, the, 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 just the, the theoretical fact is the one pointed out by Weinberg. If you, take this one, if you take the one parameter we're worried about and you just lift it a little bit, empty universe. 
Um, that's why trying to make sense even theoretically of this picture is so important. Way before talking about confronting it with experiment, you know that um, that there, there's there's a lot of uh, there, there's a lot of uh, overly simplistic philosophy of science that that that, that goes into these kinds of of, uh, of, of discussion. Um, uh, everyone agrees that in the end you have to compare it to nature to see <laughs> whether your theory agrees with, with 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 nature. We all agree with that, but the but the process is as you all know. Uh, you know, the cart goes beho before the horse many, many times, and at the, at the frontiers of discovery, things are very chaotic. You often have the right answer to the wrong question or the other way around, and, uh, and, it's, and, and prematurely uh, uh, judging a theory before you even understand what it's about is probably not the way to go. So, uh, so if this conceptual structure was so well understood that it made sharp predictions, we would already know if it's right or wrong. <laughs> Um, and uh, if it was right, we'd know. If it's wrong, no one would be thinking about it anymore. But it's deeply confusing, just theoretically. It's deeply confusing. And the reason people are, are sort of excited to think about it is it's not confusing for stupid reasons. It's confusing because of some very deep issues that we all knew we had to understand eventually anyway that, that are related to questions of how to apply quantum mechanics to the entire universe, for example, um, uh, and other related questions to that. These are sort of problems that were sitting there in the background for a long time that a lot of people hoped, ah, we don't have to answer those questions in order to understand many of the other practical, practical to a particle physicist uh, question. Um, so we can sort of ignore these things that, that, are, that are looming that eventually have got to be understood. But it's often a good sign when physics doesn't allow you to ignore monsters. Okay? And so, um, so it seems that in order to understand the, the, these questions, not about the dynamics of the world, which we've understood now, uh, we understand uh, how it works, but this one layer up for why we have this particular set of choices and not others, that we really have to understand s some of these monstrous issues that have been sitting around for a long time. And that's the state of affairs with that, with that, uh, with that multiverse picture right now. It's in such a primitive theoretical state that it's not even worth asking whether it's right or wrong uh, because that would demand far bigger level of sophistication of, under, of understanding what it predicts than we have any access to. But um, w had it been that uh, Weinberg's argument gave you a cosmological constant that was 20 orders of magnitude bigger? Uh, had it been that there was no possibility of some argument like that for the Higgs mass? Um, it wouldn't have meant that it still might not be worth thinking about these questions, but there'd be a lot less impetus for it. It's a sort of collusion of... Uh, of, of the absence of a compelling explanation for why the universe is big, together with the fact that these questions are sitting there and need to be understood, that, uh, that makes it seem like a worthwhile set of things to think about. It could all be complete crap. Okay? It could really all be a complete crap. But, uh, but, but it won't be decided by philosophy. It'll be decided by people doing computations and doing hard work. So let's have our last question from Chris. Absolutely. We'd probably have to measure properties, but it will be a lot like the Higgs, you know, like like uh, um, you know, as, as as you know very well. Once we know the mass of the Higgs, the fact that its cross section was within you know five orders of magnitude on each side of the correct answer is very surprising, right? So already the fact that things were measured and agreed to a factor of two in very early days, it's got to be the Higgs, right? Now, of course. We can go measure its properties better and better. It's very important to measure the properties better and better. We could be surprised. You know, I'm not saying that none of that should be done. But at some point, you know, we also don't know for a fact that the atoms on Pluto are the same as the atoms on Earth. <laughs> but you have to switch to an attitude where you believe that, that what you have, the simplest explanation is correct until you have uh, things otherwise. So along the same lines, if we discover a spin three halves particle and we don't discover um, and we don't discover a whole tower of other particles above it. So, so I mean, there are little caveats in the arguments that, that I told you. The, 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 the most important caveat is that these are sort of isolated particles. That you know, you have this collection of particles, you go to very high energies, and you don't keep running to more and more and more and more of them as you go to, uh, you know, every ten, every two TeV, you, you hit another particle, another particle, another particle. But you, that, that you've managed to isolate some some set of particles. So, if we see a spin three halves particle and not you know, a five halves, seven halves, a whole tower above it, then it can't be anything other than, it can't be anything other than supersymmetry. Um, 
And, uh, and of course, it's also very hard to see directly because it would be gravitationally interactive. So we won't see the spin 3 ups particle totally directly, but it could be the missing energy. It could be, uh, we, we, we can see it indirectly. Great. So let's, let's thank Nima again thank for you. a really exciting <laughs>